Chapter 15, Part 7 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 7. The Empire of Dionysus. Having made himself master of all Greek Sicily, the lord of Syracuse began to extend the compass of his ambition beyond the bounds of the island. He began to plan the conquest of Greek Italy. Hitherto, the Sicilian cities, though they had constant dealings with the colonies of the Italian mainland, had never sought there, or anywhere, out of their own island, a field for conquest or aggression. The restriction of Sicilia ambition to Sicilian territory was the other side of the doctrine preached by Hermocrates, that the Siciliots should not allow Greeks from beyond the sea to interfere in the affairs of Sicily. We are reminded of the policy which has been followed on a greater scale by the United States on the American continent. Here, as in other things, Dionysus was an innovator. He set the example of enterprises of conquest beyond the sea. Into the enterprise of Italian conquest, he was naturally led on by his dealings with the fellow cities of the Strait, Masana, and Regium. For Masana was a city once more. It had been rebuilt by Dionysus himself. He settled in it colonists from Locri and Medma in Italy, and 600 Mycenaeans from Old Greece, who had been wandering about homeless since Sparta had driven them from Napoctus. But this favor to the Mycenaeans displeased the Spartans, and as Dionysus claved to the friendship of Sparta, he yielded to their protests. He removed the exiles from Masana, but he made for them a secure, though less illustrious home. He founded the city of Tyndarus on a high hill to the west of Mile, and fortified it strongly. The walls and towers, which still remain, are a good specimen of the fortifications of Dionysus. The restoration of Masana and the foundation of Tyndarus were no pleasant sight to the Ionian city across the strait. These new cities seemed to Regium, a Syracusan menace. The men of Regium sought to make a countermove by founding a city themselves between Tyndarus and Masana. They gathered together the exiles from Catane and Naxos, and settled them on the peninsula of Mile, but the settlement lasted only for a moment. Almost immediately, the town of Mile was captured by its neighbors of Masana, and the exiles were driven out to resume their wanderings. Apart from his political hostility to Regium, Dionysus is said to have borne it a private grudge. He had asked the men of Regium to give him one of their maidens to wife, and they had answered that they would give him none but the hangman's daughter. Locri, Regium's neighbor, then granted him the request, which Regium refused. Locri was his faithful ally, and now, when the conclusion of peace with Carthage had left him free to pursue his Italian designs, it was Locri that he made his base of operations. The first object was to capture Regium. Its position on the strait dictated this, apart from all motives of revenge or hatred. Accordingly, starting from Locri with an army and fleet, he laid siege to Regium by land and sea but the confederate cities of the Italian coast came to the assistance of a member of their league. The Italian armament worsted the fleet of Dionysus in or near the strait, and Dionysus escaped with difficulty to the opposite coast. Regium was thus relieved, and Dionysus now directed his hostilities against the Italian federation. He made an alliance with the Lucanians, to the intent that they and he should carry on a war in common against the Italian cities, they by land and he by sea. In accordance with this treaty, the Lucanians invaded the land of Thurai. The men of Thurai retorted by invading Lucania in considerable force, but they sustained a crushing defeat at the hands of the barbarians. Most of the Thurians were slain, but some escaped to the shore and swam out to ships which they described coasting along. By a curious chance, the ships were the fleet of Syracuse, and Leptines, the tyrant's brother, was once more the commander. He received the fugitives and did more. He landed and ransomed them from the Lucanians. He did even more than this. He arranged an armistice between the Lucanians and the Italians. And acting thus, he clearly went beyond his powers. He had been sent to cooperate with the Lucanians against the Italians, and he had no right to conclude an armistice in such circumstances without consulting his brother. It is not surprising that Dionysus deposed him from the command. In the following year, Dionysus took the field himself. He opened the campaign by laying siege to Colonia, the northern neighbor of Locri. The Italiots, under the active lead of Croton, collected an army of 15,000 foot and 2,000 horse, and entrusted the command to Haloris, 
a brave exile of Syracuse, who burned with hatred against the tyrant who had banished him. The federal army marched forth from Croton to relieve Colonia, and when Dionysus learned of its approach, he decided to go forth to meet it. For his own forces, 20,000 foot and 3,000 horse were considerably superior. Luck favored him. Near the river Eliporus, which flows into the sea, between Colonia and Croton, the tyrant heard that the enemy were encamped, within a distance of five miles, and he drew up his men in battle array. Haloris, less well informed, rode forward in front of his main army, with a company of five hundred men, and suddenly found himself in the presence of the Syracusan host. He did not quail or flee. Sending back a message to hasten the rest of his army, he and his little band stood firm against the onset of the invaders. Haloris fell himself, and the main army, coming up company by company in haste and disorder, was easily routed by Dionysus. Ten thousand fugitives escaped to a high hill, but it was a poor hill of refuge, for there was no spring of water, and they could not hold out. The next morning they besought Dionysus, who kept watch around the hill throughout the night, to set them free for a ransom. Dionysus refused. He would accept only unreserved surrender. But he was cruel only to grant them a greater mercy than they could themselves have dared to ask. When they came down the hill, Dionysus himself told their number, with a wand as they filed past him, and each man deemed that his doom would be bondage, if not death. But Dionysus let them all depart, even without exacting a ransom. This act of mercy, which was notable as compared not only with other acts of the tyrant, but with the ordinary practice of the age, produced a great sensation. There is no reason for imputing it to a magnanimous impulse. It was a deliberate act of policy. Dionysus did not wish to be generous, but he wished to be regarded as generous and win over the Italiot cities. For this purpose, he made up his mind to sacrifice 10,000 ransom. His wisdom was soon approved. The communities to which the captives belonged gratefully voted him golden crowns and made separate treaties with him. In this way, he accomplished his purpose. With Regium, Colonia, and Hipponian, he still remained at war. But these states were now isolated, and the League was broken up. Regium bought off his hostilities for the time by surrendering its fleet. Colonia was captured and abolished, and its territory given to Locri. Hipponian was likewise taken and destroyed, but the peoples of both these cities were transplanted to Syracuse, and became Syracusan citizens. But Dionysus had not yet finished with Regium. He created a pretext for renewing hostilities, and he laid siege to the city. The men of Regium had now no friends to help them, but under their general, Phaeton, whom the tyrant vainly endeavored to bribe, they held out for ten months, and were reduced to surrender in the end by starvation. Dionysus accepted ransoms for those who could find the money. The rest of the inhabitants were sold. Phaeton was selected for special vengeance. He was scourged through the army, and then drowned with all his kin. Thus Dionysus gained what hitherto had been one of his most pressing desires, possession of the city, which had so long hated and defied him. He was now master of both sides of the strait, and held the fortress which was the bulwark of Greek Italy. Eight years later he captured Croton, and his power in Italy reached its greatest height. But in the meanwhile the unresting lord of Syracuse had turned his eyes to a region of enterprise further afield. The needs of his treasury, if nothing else, bent his attention to commerce. We touch here upon that side of ancient enterprise which has been persistently and provokingly withdrawn from our vision, because the writers of antiquity never thought of lingering on the ordinary business transactions which were happening every day before their eyes. Many things that are now dark would be cleared up if we had more knowledge of the operations of Greek trade. Dionysus saw an opening for Sicilian commerce along the eastern and western coasts of the Hadriatic Sea, in whose waters the ships of Corsera, Athens, and Taras hitherto had chiefly plied. He set about making the Hadriatic a Syracusan lake by means of settlements and alliances. He founded settlements in Apulia, which he probably hoped ultimately to incorporate in his dominion. He settled a colony and fixed a naval station in the island of Issa whose importance as a strategic post has been more than once illustrated in subsequent history. He took part with the Pereans in colonizing Pharos, on an island not far from Issa. A Syracusan colony was planted at Ancon, and even if the colonists were, as they are said to have been, exiles and foes of Dionysus, we may be sure that the merchant ships of Syracuse were welcome at the wharfs of Ancon. The northern goal of these merchant ships was near the mouth of the Pope, 
at a spot where there was already a mart for diffusing Greek merchandise into Cisalpine Gaul and beyond the Alps into northern Europe. This was the Venetian Hadria, city of marshes and canals, which was now colonized by Dionysus, to be in some sort, as has been aptly observed, a forerunner of Venice itself. It was in one of these outlying posts of the Hellenic world that the historian, to whom we owe our best knowledge of the Sicilian history of this time, probably wrote his works. Philistus had held posts of high trust under Dionysus, and had even been the commandant of the Syracusan citadel. But in later years, he incurred his master's displeasure, or suspicion, and chose as his place of banishment some city on the Hadriatic, possibly Hadria. In connection with these Hadriatic designs, touching which we have only the most fragmentary records, Dionysus formed an alliance with Alcetus of Molotia, whose unstable position in his own kingdom made him willing to be a dependent on the strong ruler of Syracuse. Thus Dionysus made his influence predominant at the gates of the Hadriatic. The Syracusan Empire, we may survey it, when it reached its widest extent, consisted, like most other empires, partly of immediate dominion and partly of dependent communities. The immediate dominion was both insular and continental. It included the greater portion of Sicily and the southern peninsula of Italy, perhaps as far north as the river Crathus. But this dominion was not homogeneous, and the relations of its various parts to the government of Syracuse. There was first of all the old territory of the Syracusan Republic. There were secondly a number of military settlements, an institution of Dionysus which has been compared to the military colonies of Rome. Such, for example, was Croton on the mainland. Such in Sicily were Henna and Messana. Such was Issa in the Hadriatic. Outside these direct subjects was the third class of the allied cities, which, though absolutely subject to the power of Dionysus, had still the management of their less important affairs in their own hands. To this class belonged the old Greek cities of Sicily, like Gela and Camarina, new colonies like Tyndarus, some Sicil states like Agirium and Erbita. Beyond the sphere of direct dominion stretched the sphere of dependencies. The allies, whose bond of dependence was rather implied than formally expressed, here belong the cities of the Italian League, Thurii and the rest, north of the Crathus River. Here belong some of the Iapogean communities in the heel of Italy, and here the kingdom of Melosia beyond the Ionian Sea, and some Illyrian places on the Hadriatic coast. The Crathus may be regarded as the line between the two, the outer and the inner, divisions of the empire of Dionysus, but it is remarkable that at one time he planned a wall and a ditch which should run across the isthmus from Scalation to the nearest point on the other sea, a distance of about 20 miles, and thus sever, as it were, the toe of Italy from the mainland, and make it a sort of second Sicily. The acquisition and maintenance of this empire, the building of ships and ship sheds, the payment of mercenary soldiers, the vast fortifications of Syracuse, both of the island and of the hill, all this, along with the ordinary expenses of government and the state of a despot's court, demanded an enormous outlay. To meet this outlay, Dionysus was forced to resort to extraordinary expedients. In the first place, he oppressed the Syracusans by a burdensome taxation. He imposed special taxes for war, special taxes for building ships, and he introduced an honorious tax on cattle. It is said that the citizens paid yearly into the treasury at the rate of 20% of their capital. In the second place, he had recourse to a various expedients, affecting the coinage. Thus, he issued debased fordrachum, pieces of tin instead of silver. And in one case of financial need, he paid a debt by placing on each coin an official mark, which rendered it worth double of its true value. But such expedients were not enough. Dionysus was an unscrupulous rifler of temples. Thus, when he took Croton, he carried off the treasures of a temple of Hera. In an earlier year, he sailed like a pirate to Etruria, swooped down on a rich temple at the port of Agila, and bore off booty which amounted to the value of 1,500 talents. The plunder of a sanctuary on distant barbarian shores might seem a small thing, but no awe of divine displeasure restrained Dionysus from planning a raid upon the holiest place of Hellenic worship. He formed the design of robbing the treasury of Delphi itself, with Illyrian and Molosian help, but the plan miscarried. It is little wonder that the tyrant had an evil repute in the mother country. End of chapter 15, part 7. Recording by Paul Sutton.
A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 15, Part 8. Death of Dionysus, Estimate of His Work It was only for a moment that the dominion of the Syracusan despot reached its extreme limits. He had hardly won the city and lands of Croton when his borders fell back in the west of his own island. A new war with Carthage had broken out, and this time, if Dionysus was not the first to draw the sword, he at least provoked hostilities. He entered into alliances with some of the cities dependent on Carthage, possibly Segesta or Eryx. Of the campaigns we know almost nothing, except their result. First we find Carthage helping the Italiots with whom the tyrant was at war. Next we find a Carthaginian force in Sicily commanded by Mago. In a battle fought at Kabbalah, a place unknown, the Syracusans won a great victory and Mago was killed. While negotiations for peace were proceeding, another battle was fought at Cronion, near Panormus, and fate reversed her reward. Dionysus was defeated with terrible loss and compelled to make a disadvantageous peace. The boundary of Greek against Punic Sicily was withdrawn from the river Mazaras to the river Helesus. This meant that the deliverer of Salinas and Thermae gave back those cities to the mercies of the barbarians. At the mouth of the Helesus, the old Greek foundation of Heraclea Manoa now became, under the corresponding Punic name, Ras Melkart, one of the chief strongholds of the Punic power. Just ten years later, ten years in which the history of Sicily is a blank, Dionysus essayed to retrieve the losses which the disastrous battle of Cronion had brought upon him. He made war once more upon Carthage, and for the second time he invaded Punic Sicily. He delivered Greek Salinas. He won Campanian and Tala, and captured Elemian Eryx, along with its haven, Trapanon. He then attempted, we may almost say, to repeat the great exploit of his first war. There was no more a Moitia to capture, but he laid siege to Lilybium, which had taken Moitia's place. But he was compelled to abandon the attempt. The fortress was too strong, and his ill success was soon crowned by the loss of a large part of his fleet, which was carried out of the harbor of Draponin by an enterprising Carthaginian admiral. It was the last undertaking of the great ruler of Sicily. He did not live to conclude the peace which probably confirmed the Helesus as the boundary between Greek and Barbarian. His death was connected with a side of his character which has not yet come before us. The tyrant of Syracuse has a place, though it is a small place, in literary history. He was a dramatic poet, and he frequently competed with his tragedies in the Athenian theater. He won third, he won even second prizes but his dearest ambition was to be awarded a first place. That desire was at length fulfilled. His failure at Lilibium and the loss of his ships at Draponin were compensated by the tidings that the first prize had been assigned to his ransom of Hector at the Linnaean festival. He celebrated his joy by an unwanton carouse. His intemperance was followed by a fever, and a soropific drought was administered to him which induced the sleep of death. Dionysus did not stand wholly aloof from the politics of elder Greeks. His alliance with Sparta and the help which he received from her at the siege of Syracuse involved him in obligations to her, which he fulfilled on more than one occasion. And in the regions of Corsera, his empire came into direct contact with the spheres of some of the states of the mother country. But these political relations are an unimportant part of his reign. His reign, as a whole, lies apart from the contemporary politics of elder Greeks. Yet, from some points of view, it possesses more significance in Grecian and in European history than the contemporary history of Sparta and Athens. In the first place, Dionysus stands out as one of the most prominent champions of Europe in the long struggle between the Asiatic and the European for the possession of Sicily. He did what no champion had done before. He carried the war into the enemy's precinct. He well nigh achieved what it was reserved for an Italian commonwealth to achieve actually. The reclaiming of the whole island for Europe, the complete expulsion of the Semitic intruder. In the second place, he stands out as the man who raised his own city, not only to dominion over all Greek Sicily, but to a transmarine dominion which made her the most powerful city in the Greek world, the most potent state in Europe. The purely Sicilian policy is flung aside and Syracuse becomes a continental power. Laying one hand on that peninsula to which her own island geographically belongs, and stretching out the other to the lands beyond the Hadriatic. And thirdly, this empire, though it is thinly disguised like the later empire of Rome under constitutional forms, is really a monarchical realm, which is a foreshadowing of the Macedonian monarchies and an anticipation of a new period in European history.
Again in the Art of War, Dionysus inaugurated methods, which did not come into general use till more than half a century later. Some of his military operations seem to transport us to the age of Alexander the Great and his successors. Dionysus anticipated the age of those monarchs. Statues were set up representing him in the guise of Dionysus, the god by whose name he was called. Here indeed, he did not stand alone among his contemporaries. The Spartan Lysander also had been invested with attributes of divinity. But in one respect, Dionysus was far from being a forerunner of the Macedonian monarchs. He was not an active or deliberate diffuser of Hellenic civilization. On the contrary, he appears rather as an undoer of Hellenic civilization. He destroys Hellenic towns, and he replaces Hellenic by Italian communities. He cultivates the friendship of Gauls and Lucanians to use them against Greeks, not to make them Greeks. This side of the policy of Dionysus, the establishment of Italian settlements in Sicily, it points unintentionally indeed, so far as he was concerned, to the expansion of Italy. It points to the Italian conquest of Sicily, which was to be accomplished more than a century after his death. Dionysus, then, has the significance of a pioneer, but there is something else to be said. Original and successful as he was, great things as he did, we cannot help feeling that he ought to have done greater things still. A master of political wisdom, an originator of daring ideas, a man of endless energy, remarkably temperate in the habits of his life, he was hampered throughout by his unconstitutional position. The nature of tyranny imposed limitations on his work. He had always to consider, first, the security of his own unchartered rule. He could never forget the fact that he was a hated master. He could therefore never devote himself to the accomplishment of any object or the solution of any problem with the undivided zeal which may animate a constitutional prince who need never turn aside to examine the sure foundations of his power. We saw how the tyrant's warfare against Carthage was affected by these personal calculations. The Syracusan tyranny accomplished indeed far more than could have been accomplished by the Syracusan democracy. Dionysus as a tyrant wrought what he could never have wrought, as a mere statesman governing by legitimate influence the councils of a free assembly. But he illustrates, and all the more strikingly, as a pioneer of the great monarchies of the future, the truth to which attention has been called before, that the tyrannies and democracies of Greek cities were in their nature not adapted to create and maintain large empires. End of chapter 15, part 8. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, part 9. Dionysus the Younger. The empire of Dionysus, which he had made fast, to use his own expression, by chains of adamant, a strong army, a strong navy, and strong walls, descended to his son, Dionysus, a youth of feeble character, not without amiable qualities, but of the nature that is easily swayed to good or evil, and is always dependent on advisors. At first he was under the influence of Dion, who had been the most trusted minister of the elder Dionysus in the later part of his reign holding the office of admiral and allied by a double marriage with the tyrant's family. The tyrant had espoused Dion's sister, Aristomache, and Dion married one of the daughters of this marriage, Arete, his own niece. The other daughter was given to Dionysus, her half-brother. Another man, possessing the pride, wealth, and ability of Dion, might have sought to fling aside Dionysus, and if he did not seize the tyranny himself, at all events to secure it for the sons of his sister, the brothers of his wife, Hipparinus and Nicaeus. But Dion was not like other men. His aspirations were loftier and less selfish. His object was not to secure tyranny for any man, but to get rid of tyranny altogether. But this was not to be done by a revolution. The democracy which would have risen on the ruins of the despotism would have been in Dion's eyes as evil a thing for Syracuse as the despotism itself. For Dion had imbibed, and thoroughly believed in, the political teachings of his friend, Plato the philosopher. His darling project was to establish at Syracuse a constitution, which would so far as possible conform to the theoretical views of Plato, and which would probably have taken the shape of a limited kingship, with some resemblance to the constitution of Sparta, and this could never have been brought about by a pure vote of the Syracusan people. The ideal constitution must be imposed upon them for their own good. The sole chance lay in persuading a tyrant to impose limitations on his own absolute power, and introduce the required constitution. 
Give me, says Plato himself, a city governed by a tyranny, and let the tyrant be young, with good brains, brave, and generous, and let fortune bring in his way a good lawgiver. Then a state has a chance of being well governed. Dion saw in young Dionysus a nature which might be molded as he wished, a nature, perhaps which he missed in his own nephews, Hipparinus and Nicaeus. He devoted himself loyally to Dionysus, who looked up to his virtue and experience, and he set himself to interest the young ruler in philosophy and make him to take a serious view of his duties. But his chief hope lay in bringing the tyrant under the attraction of the same powerful personality which had exercised a decisive and abiding influence over him. Plato must come to Syracuse and make the tyrant a philosopher. The treatment which Plato had experienced on the occasion of a previous visit to Sicily at the hands of the elder Dionysus was not indeed such as to encourage him to return. But he yielded, reluctantly, to the pressing invitation of the young ruler and the urgent solicitations of Dion, who represented that now, at last, the moment had come to call an ideal state into actual existence. It was the vision of a dreamer dreaming greatly, and that a statesman of Dion's practical experience and knowledge of human nature should have allowed himself to be guided by such a dream may seem strange to us, to us to whom the history of hundreds of societies throughout a period of more than 2,000 years has brought disillusion. It has indeed seemed so curious that some have concluded that Dion was throughout plotting to dethrone Dionysus, that the philosophical scheme was part of the plot, and Plato an unconscious tool of the conspiracy. But the good faith of Dion seems assured. We must remember that a state founded on philosophical principles was a new idea, which was not at all likely to seem foredoomed to failure to anyone who was enamored of philosophy, for such a state had never been tried and consequently there was no example of a previous failure. On the contrary, there was the example of Sparta as a success. The political speculators of those days always turned with special predilection to Sparta as a well-balanced state, and it was believed that her constitution and discipline had been called into being and established for all time by the will and fiat of a single extraordinarily wise lawgiver. Why then should not Dionysus and Dion, under the direction of Plato, do for Syracuse what Lysurgus had done for Lacedaemon. And Dion doubtless thought that his own experience would enable him to adjust the demands of speculation to the rude realities of existence. No welcome could have been more honorable and flattering than that which Plato received. He engaged the respect and admiration of Dionysus. And the young tyrant was easily brought to regard tyranny as a vile thing, and to cherish the plan of building up a new constitution. The experiment would probably have been tried if Plato in dealing with his pupil had acted otherwise than he did. The nature of Dionysus was one of those natures which are susceptible of impression and capable of enthusiasm, but incapable of persevering application. If Plato had contented himself with inculculating the general principles which he has expounded with such charm in his Republic, Dionysus would in all likelihood have attempted to create at Syracuse a dim adumbration of the ideal state. It is hardly likely that it would have been long maintained. Still, it would at least have been essayed, but Plato insisted on imparting to his pupil a systematic course of philosophical training, and began with a science of geometry. The tyrant took up the study with eagerness. His court was absorbed in geometry, but he presently wearied of it. And then influences which were opposed to the scheme of Dion and Plato began to tell. One of the first acts of the new reign had been to recall from exile the historian Philistus. He was entirely adverse to the proposed reforms, and wished that the tyranny should continue on its old lines. He and his friends insinuated that the true object of Dion was to secure the tyranny for one of his own nephews, as soon as Dionysus had laid it down. They did everything to turn Dionysus against Dion, and at last an indiscreet letter of Dion gave them the means of success. Syracuse and Carthage were negotiating peace, and Dion wrote to the Carthaginian judges not to act without first consulting him. The letter was intercepted, and though its motive was doubtless perfectly honest, it was interpreted as treason. Dion was banished from Sicily, but was allowed to retain his property, and the party of Philistus won the upper hand. Plato remained for a while in the island. Dionysus was jealous of the esteem which he felt for Dion and desired above all things to win the same esteem for himself. But the philosopher's visit had been a failure. He yearned to get back to Athens, and at length Dionysus let him go.
So ended the notable scheme of founding an ideal state, the realization of which would have involved the disbandment of the mercenary troops and thereby the collapse of the Syracusan Empire. It is easy to ridicule Plato for want of tact in his treatment of the young tyrant. It is easy to flout him as a pedant for not distinguishing between an academy and a court. But Plato was perfectly right. The only motive which had brought him to Sicily was to prepare the way for founding a new state fashioned more or less according to his own ideals. Now, the first condition of the life of such a state was that a king should be a philosopher. Therefore, as Dionysus, not Plato, was to be king in the new state, it was indispensable that Dionysus should become a philosopher. Plato had not the smallest interest in imparting to the tyrant a superficial smattering of philosophy, enough to beguile him into framing a platonic state. For that state would have been stillborn, since it lacked the first condition of life, a true philosopher at its head. If Dionysus had not the stuff of a true, but only of a sham philosopher, it was useless to make the experiment. Plato adopted the only reasonable course. He was true to his own ideal. End of chapter 15, part 9. Recording by Paul Sutton. Chapter 15, Part 10 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2 by John Bagnell Burry. Chapter 15, Part 10. Dion. Strange as it may appear, after such experiences, Plato seems to have returned once more to Sicily, at the urgent invitation of Dionysus. He can have had no more expectations of making a philosopher out of the tyrant, and his chief motive must have been to bring about the recall of Dion and reconcile him to Dionysus, who appears to have lured the philosopher by the hope that this might be accomplished. Plato was received and entertained with as great honor as before, but his visit was fruitless. Probably the tyrant ascertained that Dion was in the meantime using his wealth to make silent preparations for winning his way back to Syracuse and overthrowing the tyranny. Dionysus, therefore, took the precaution of confiscating Dion's property, and then Plato returned to Athens as soon as he could. Dion also betook himself to Old Greece and made Athens his headquarters. Presently, the tyrant committed a needless act of tyranny, he compelled Dion's wife, Arete, to marry another man. At length, Dion deemed that the time for action had come. With a very small force, packed into not more than five merchant ships, he set sail from Zacynthus to encounter the mighty armaments of Dionysus. His coming was expected, and the Admiral Philistus had a fleet in Italian waters to waylay him. But Dion sailed straight across the open sea to Pekinus. His plan was to land in western Sicily, collect what reinforcements he could, and march on Syracuse. It was a bold enterprise, but Dion knew that the character of the tyrant was feeble, and that the Syracusans pined to be delivered from his tyranny. Driven by a storm to the Libyan coast, the ships of the Deliverer finally reached Heraclea Manoa, now a Carthaginian port, in southwestern Sicily. Here, they learned that Dionysus had departed for Italy with 80 ships, and they lost no time in marching to Syracuse, picking up reinforcements, both Greek and Sicil, on their way. The Campanian mercenaries, who were guarding Epipole, were lured away by a trick, and making a night march from Acrea, Dion and his party entered Syracuse amid general rejoicings. The assembly placed the government in the hands of twenty generals. Dion was among them. The fortress of Epipole was secured. No part of Syracuse remained in possession of Dionysus except the island and against this Dion built a wall of defense, from the greater to the lesser harbor. Seven days later, Dionysus returned. While Syracuse was rocking with the first enthusiasm at her deliverance, the deliverer was the popular hero. But Dion was not a man who could hold the affections of the people, for he repelled men by his exceeding haughtiness, and it was seen to 
that he was determined masterfully to direct the Syracusans how they were to use their freedom. Dionysus, shut up in the island, resorted to artifices to raise suspicion against him in the minds of the citizens. An arrival appeared on the scene who possessed more popular manners than Dion. This was a certain Heraclides, whom the tyrant had banished and who now returned with an armament of ships and soldiers. The assembly elected him admiral. Dion undid this act on the ground that his own consent was necessary, and then came forward himself to propose Heraclides. This behavior alienated the sympathies of the citizens. They did not want another autocrat. Soon afterwards, Heraclides won an important sea fight, defeating Philistus, who had returned from Italy with his squadron. The old historian himself was taken and put to death with cruelty. Dionysus thus lost his best support, and presently he escaped from the island, taking his triremes with him, but leaving a garrison of mercenaries and his young son, Apollocrates, in command. Soon after this, the influence of Dion waned so much that the Syracusans deposed him from the post of general and appointed 25 new generals, among them Heraclides. They also refused to grant any pay to the Peloponnesian deliverers who had come with Dion. The Peloponnesians would have gladly turned against the Syracusans if Dion had given the signal. But Dion, though self-willed, was too genuine a patriot to attack his own city and he retired to Leontini with 3,000 devoted men. The Syracusans then went on the siege of the island fortress, and so hard-pressed was the garrison that it determined to surrender. Heralds had been already sent to announce the decision to the Syracusans when in the early morning reinforcements arrived, soldiers and provisions brought by a Campanian of Naples, by name Nipsius, who, eluding the notice of the enemy's ships, sailed into the great harbor. The situation was changed and negotiations were immediately broken off. At first, fortune favored the Syracusans. Heraclides put out to sea and won a second sea fight, sinking or capturing whatever warships had been left behind by Dionysus or were brought by Nipsius. At this success, the city went wild with joy and spent the night in carousing. Before the dawn of day, when soldiers and generals were alike sunk in a drunken sleep, Nipsius and his troops issued from the gates of the island and surmounting the cross wall of Dion by scaling ladders, slew the guards and took possession of Lower Acredina and the Agora. All this part of the city was sacked. Full leave was given to the mercenaries to do as they listed. They carried off women and children, and all the property they could lay hands on. Next day, all the citizens who had taken refuge in Apopoli and the Upper Acredina, looking hopelessly at what had been done, and seeing what the barbarians were beginning their horrible work again, Messengers, riding as swiftly as they could, reached Leontini towards evening. Dion led them to the theater, and there, before the gathered folk, the envoys told their tale and implored Dion and the Peloponnesians to forget the ingratitude of Syracuse and come to her help. Dion made a moving speech. He would in any case go, and if he could not save his city, he would bury himself in her ruin. But the Peloponnesians might well refuse to stir for a people which had entreated them so ill. A shout went up that Syracuse must be rescued, and for the second time, Dion led the Peloponnesians to her deliverance. They set out at once, and a night march brought them to Megara, five or six miles from Syracuse at the dawn of day. There, dreadful tidings reached them. Nipsius, knowing that the rescue was on its way, and deeming that no time was to be lost, had let loose his barbarians again into the city at midnight. They no longer thought of plunder, but only of slaying and burning. At this news, the army of rescue hurried on to save what might still be saved. Entering by the Hexapylon on the north, Dion cleared his way before him through Arachidina, and reached the cross wall, which he had himself built as a defense against the island. It was now broken down, but behind its ruins, Nipsius had posted a body of his mercenaries, and this was the scene of the decisive struggle. Dion's men carried the wall, and the foe was driven back into the fortress of Ortigia. The opponents of Dion, who had not fled, were humbled. Heraclides besought his pardon, and Dion was blamed for not putting him to death. It was at all events foolish magnanimity, which consented to the arrangement that Dion should be general with full power on land, and Heraclides by sea. The old dissension soon broke out, and presently we find a Spartan named Gesilus reconciling the rivals and constraining Heraclides to swear solemnly to do nothing against Dion. Nipsius seems to have disappeared from the scene, 
and it was not long before the son of Dionysus, wary of the long siege, made up his mind to surrender the island to Dion. During all these dreadful events, Dion's sister, Aristomache, and his wife, Arete, had been kept in the island. Dion now took back his wife. The time at last came for Dion to show what his political aims really were. He professed to have come to give Syracuse freedom, but the freedom which he would have given her was not such as she herself desired. The Syracusan citizens wanted the restoration of their democracy. But to Dion, democracy seemed as bad a form of government as tyranny. If taught by experience, he no longer dreamed of a platonic state. He desired to establish an aristocracy, with some democratic limitations, and with a king, or kings, as in Sparta. With this purpose in view, he sent to Corinth for helpers and advisors, and he expressed his leanings to the Corinthian oligarchy by an issue of coins with a flying horse, modeled on the pegasi of Corinth. But though Dion hoped to establish a state in which the few should govern the many, he made a grave mistake in not immediately placing himself above the suspicion of being a selfish power seeker, a possible tyrant. The Syracusans longed to see the fortress of the tyrant demolished, and if Dion had complied with their wish, he might have secured for himself abiding influence. But though he did not live in the fortress, he allowed it to remain, and its existence seemed a standing invitation to tyranny. Dion had no intention of allowing the Syracusans to manage their own affairs, and the enjoyment of power corrupted him. His authority was only limited by the joint command of Heracletes, and at last he was brought to consent that his rival should be secretly assassinated. After this, he was to all purposes tyrant, though he might repudiate tyranny with his lips. Among those who had come with him from Elder Greece to liberate Syracuse was a pupil of Plato, named Callipus, and this man plotted to overthrow Dion, who trusted him implicitly. Aristomachy and Arete suspected him and taxed him with treachery, nor were they assured until he had taken the most solemn oath that a mortal could take. He went to the precinct of the great goddesses Demeter and Persephone. The priest wrapped him in the purple robe of the queen of the underworld, and gave him a lighted torch. In this guise he swore that he plotted no evil design against Dion, but so little regard had Callipus for religion that he chose the festival of the maiden by whom he had sworn for the execution of his plot. He employed some men of Zacynthus to murder Dion and then seize the power himself. The tyranny of Callipus lasted for about a year. Then, while he was engaged in an attack on Catane, the two sons of the elder Dionysus by his second wife, Hipparinus and Nicias, came to Syracuse and won possession of Ortigia. These brothers were a worthless pair, drunken and dissolute. Hipparinus held the island for about two years. Then he was murdered in a fit of drunkenness and was succeeded by Nicaeus, who ruled Ortigia five years longer. It is not certain how far these tyrants were able to assert their authority over Syracuse outside the precincts of the island. During all these changes, Dionysus was living at Locri, the native city of his mother, and ruling it with a tyrant's rod. His cruelty and the outrages which he committed on the freeborn maidens of the city provoked universal hatred. At length he saw the chance of recovering Syracuse. Leaving his wife and daughters at Locri with a small garrison, he sailed to Ortigia and drove out Nicias. As soon as he had gone, the Locrians arose and easily overcame his mercenaries. The enormities of which the tyrant had been guilty may best be measured by the brutal thirst of vengeance which now consumed the citizens of Locri. No supplications, no intervention, no offers of ransom could turn them away from wreaking their pent-up hatred on the wife and daughters of Dionysus. The women were submitted to the most horrible tortures and insults before they were strangled. The sea was sown with their ashes. End of chapter 15, part 10. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 15, Part 11. Timolean. At this moment, tyrannies flourished in Sicily. Besides Syracuse, the cities of Messana, Leontini, and Catane, and many Sicil towns were under the yoke of tyrants. Syracuse was at least half free. Dionysus held only the island, but the Syracusans, for lack of another leader, looked for help and guidance in their struggle against their own tyrant to the man who had made himself lord of Leontini. 
This was a certain Hecatus, a man ill to deal with, who was a follower of Dion. But after Dion's death caused his wife and sister to be drowned while they were sailing to the Peloponnesus, this Hecatus was aiming at becoming himself Lord of Syracuse, and he hoped to accomplish this purpose with the help of Carthage. But he veiled his designs, and he supported an appeal which the Sicilian Greeks now addressed to Corinth. It was an appeal for help, both against the plague of tyranny which was rampant in Sicily, and against the Carthaginians who were preparing a great armament to descend upon the troubled island. The Syracusans selected Hecatus as their general. Corinth, ever a solicitous mother to her colonies, was ready to respond to the appeal, and the only difficulty was to find a suitable commander. Someone in the assembly, by a sudden inspiration, arose and named Timoleon, the son of Timodemus. Belonging to a noble family, and notable by his personal qualities, Timoleon was living under a strange cloud, though a deed which some highly praised and others severely blamed. He had saved his brother's life in battle at the risk of his own, but when that brother afterwards plotted to make himself tyrant, Timoleon and some friends put him to death. His mother and many others abhorred him as guilty of a brother's blood, while others admired him as the slayer of a tyrant. In the light of his later deeds, we know that Timoleon was actuated by the highest motives of duty when he consented to his brother's death. Ever since that terrible day, he had lived in a retirement, but when his name was mentioned in the assembly, all approved, and Telecletes, a man of influence, expressed the general thought by saying, We shall decide that he slew a tyrant if he is successful, that he slew his brother if he fails. The enterprise was to be Timoleon's ordeal. With ten ships of war, a few fellow citizens, and about one thousand mercenaries, Timoleon crossed the Ionian Sea, guided, it was said, by the track of a flaming torch, the emblem of the Sicilian goddesses, Demeter and Persephone. At Regium, now free from the rule of tyrants, he met with a warm welcome. But he found a Carthaginian fleet awaiting him there, and likewise ambassadors from Hecatus who demanded that the ships and soldiers should be sent back to Corinth, since the Carthaginians would not permit them to cruise the Sicilian waters. As for Timoleon himself, Hecatus would be pleased to have his help and counsel. Timoleon had no thought of heeding such a message. It was not to set up the rule of Hecatus at Syracuse that he had come, or to submit to the dictation of the foes of Hellas. But the difficulty was to leave the roadstead of Regium in face of the Punic fleet. Here, Timoleon showed caution and craft. He pretended to agree to the proposals, but he asked that the whole matter and the intentions of Achetus should be clearly stated in the presence of the Regine people. With the connivance of the Regines, time was wasted, and the Carthaginians and the ambassadors of Achetus were detained in the assembly until the Corinthian ships had put out to sea, Timoleon himself slipping away just in time to embark in the last of them. He made straight for Torimenium. It will be remembered that Torimenium, planted by Hamilco to be a Sicil city, had been taken by Dionysus to be an abode for his mercenaries. Amid the troubles after the tyrant's death, it had gained its independence, and a citizen named Andromachus had become the foremost man in its public affairs. Andromachus induced his fellow citizens to offer a home to the homeless Naxians, whose parents Dionysus had so cruelly disposed. The Naxians came back to the hill which looked down on the place of their old city. Naxos revived in Torimenium, and the Naxians were the first Sicilians to welcome the deliverer of Sicily to her shores. Timoleon's first success was at Hadranum, the Sicil town where the great Sicilian fire god Hadranus had his chief abode. The men of Hadranum were at discord among themselves. Some would summon Hecatus, others invited Timoleon, but both Hecatus and Timoleon came. It was a race between them to get to Hadranum first. Timoleon, the later to arrive, surprised the enemy as they were resting outside the town, and defeated them, although in numbers they were five to one. The gates of the city were then thrown open, and Hadranum became the headquarters of Timoleon's army. Soon afterwards, Hecatus suborned two men to assassinate the Corinthian leader, but the plot was frustrated at the last moment, and henceforth the belief gained ground that Timoleon was hedged about by some divine protection. The fire god of Hadranum, too, had shown by miraculous signs that he approved of the stranger's enterprise. Others now allied themselves with Timoleon, and presently Dionysus sent a message to him, proposing to surrender the island and asking only to be allowed to retire in safety to Corinth with his private property. 
The offer was at once accepted. The fortress and the mercenaries who guarded it and all the war gear were transferred to Timolean. Dionysus lived the rest of his life at Corinth in harmless obscurity. Many anecdotes were told of the trivial doings of the fallen lord of Sicily and his smart sayings. When someone contrasted his fortune with that of his father, he remarked, My father came into power when democracy was hated, but I, when tyranny was envied. Having won Ortigia sooner and more easily than could have been hoped, it remained for Timoleon to liberate the rest of Syracuse, which was in the hands of Hecatus. But Hecatus had powerful allies. 150 Carthaginian ships, under the command of Mago, sailed into the Great Harbor, and a Carthaginian force was admitted into Syracuse. The Corinthian commander in the island, Timolean himself still abode at Hadranum, was hard-pressed, but presently Mago and Hecatus went off to besiege Catane, and Neon, making a successful sally, occupied Acredina. At the same time, reinforcements from Corinth, which had been for some time delayed in Italy by the Carthaginian fleet, arrived in Sicily. It was now time for Timolean himself to appear at Syracuse. He pitched his camp on the south side of the banks of Anapus. Then another piece of luck befell him. The Greek mercenaries, both his own and those of Acadus, used to amuse their idle hours by fishing for eels at the mouth of the river. And as they had no cause of quarrel, though they were ready to kill each other for pay, they used to converse amicably on such occasions. One of Timolean's soldiers observed that the Greeks ought to combine against the barbarians, and the words coming to the ears of Mago caused him to conceive suspicions of Hecatus. He suddenly sailed off with all of his fleet, but when he reached Carthage, he slew himself and his countrymen crucified his corpse. This story, however, can hardly be whole explanation of Mago's strange behavior. Thus freed from his most formidable foe, Timolean soon drew Hecatus from Apopoli, and Syracuse was at length completely free. The Syracusans had found a deliverer who did not, like Dion, seek to be their master, and the fortress of Dionysus was pulled down. This act of demolition seemed the seal and assurance of their deliverance, but the city was dispeopled and desolate. Grass grew in the marketplace, and the first task of the deliverer was to repopulate it with new citizens. The Corinthians made proclamations at the festivals of elder Greeks, inviting emigrants to resettle Syracuse. Men whom the tyrants had banished flocked back and 60,000 men in all gathered both from west and east, with women and children, and restored the strength of the city. The laws of Diocles were issued anew, and the democratic constitution was revived, and in some respects remodeled. The most important innovation was the investing of Amphipolis, or priest of Olympian Zeus, with the chief magistracy. The priest was annually elected and gave his name to the year, but as he was chosen by lot out of three clans, his promotion to be the first magistrate of the Republic was a limitation of the democracy. Such was the renovation of Syracuse. And her new freedom was expressed, on some coins which were now issued by the symbol of an unbridled steed. Timolean then went on to do for other towns in Sicily what he had done for Syracuse. Many tyrants submitted, even Hecatus, who had withdrawn to Leontini. There was also work to be done against the Carthaginians, who were intent upon recovering lost ground and were preparing for another great effort to drive the Greeks out of Sicily. Five years after Timolean had landed in the island, a large armament sailed from Carthage and put in at Lilybium. It consisted of 200 galleys and 1,000 transports. There were 10,000 horses, some for war chariots, and the total number of the infantry was said to be 70,000. The flower of the host was the sacred band of 2,500 Carthaginian citizens, men of birth, and wealth. Hamilcar and Hasdrubal, the commanders, decided to march right across Sicily against Syracuse. But Timolean did not await them there. He would try to encounter them west of the Helissus in Punic, not in Grecian territory. Collecting such an army as he could, it amounted to no more than 10,000, he set out. On the march, he was deserted by 1,000 mercenaries, who clamored for arrears of pay and murmured at being led against such overwhelming odds. And with difficulty could he persuade the rest to go on. The Carthaginians were encamped on the west bank of the Cremissus, a branch of the river Hypsus, not that which washes a Cragus, but that which flows through the territory of Salinas. The city of Antella, now held by Campanians, was situated on the Cremissus, and it may be that the Punic army had halted with the hope of taking it. The field of battle, which was now fought between the Greeks and Phoenicians on the banks of the Cremissus, is unknown. 
In the morning, the Greeks ascended a hill which divided them from the river, and on their way they met mules laden with wild celery, a herb which was used to wreathe sepulchral slabs. The soldiers were depressed by an incident which seemed ominous of evil, but of the same herb was wrought the crowns of victors in the Isthmian games. And Timolean hastened to interpret the chance as an augury of victory. He wreathed his head with a celery, and the whole host followed his example. Then two eagles appeared in the sky, one bearing a serpent, another fortunate omen. The Greeks halted on the hilltop, striving to pierce the mist which enveloped the ground below them, and when it melted away they saw the enemy crossing the stream. The war chariots crossed first, and behind came the sacred band. Timolean saw that his chance lay in attacking before the whole army had crossed. He set down his cavalry to lead the attack, and himself followed with the foot. The war chariots prevented the horses from approaching the sacred band, so Timolean ordered the cavalry to move aside and assail the flank of the foe, leaving the way clear for the infantry. It is not recorded how the infantry swept away the war chariots, but they succeeded in reaching the sacred band. The Carthaginians, firm and immovable, withstood the onset of the spears, and the Greeks, finding that all their thrusting could not drive back or pierce the shield wall, flung down their spears and drew their swords. In the sword fight, it was no longer a matter of weight and courage. Skill and lithesome movements told. And the Greeks, superior in these qualities, utterly smote the sacred band. Meanwhile, the rest of the Punic army had crossed the river, and although the flower of it was destroyed, there were still enormous numbers to deal with. But fortune followed Temelane. Clouds had gathered and were hanging over the hills. And suddenly, there burst forth a tempest of lightning and wind-driven rain and hail. The Greeks had their backs to the wind. The rain and hail drove into the faces of the enemy, who in the noise could not hear the commands of their officers. When the ground became muddy, the lighter armor of the Greeks gave them a great advantage over their foes, who floundered about, weighted down by their heavy mail. At length, the Carthaginians could no longer stand their ground. And when they turned to fly, they found death in the Cremissus. Rapidly swollen by the rain, the river was now rushing along in a furious torrent, which swept men and horse to destruction. It is said that 15,000 prisoners were secured, that 10,000 men had been killed in the fight, not counting those who perished in the river. Rich spoils of gold and silver were taken in the camp. The choicest of the arms were sent to the Isthmus to be dedicated in the Temple of Poseidon. The battle was fallen out clean, contrary to what was like to have been. Timolean had gained a victory, which may be set beside Gelen's victory at Himera, but he did not follow it up. He made no attempt to cut short the Phoenician dominion in Sicily. Perhaps his inaction was due to less unwillingness than to embarrassments which threatened Syracuse. The tyrant of Catane, who had gone over to Timolean, declared against him. Hecatus seems to have seized again the tyranny of Leontini. And Timolean found himself engaged in a war with these two tyrants, Mamercus and Hecatus who were aided by Carthaginian mercenaries. At last, both the tyrants were captured. The Syracusans put them both to death and slew the wife and daughter of Hecatus in retaliation for the murder of the wife and sister of Dion. The Messenians also put to death their oppressor, Hippon, with torture, and the schoolboys were taken to the theater to witness a tyrant's death. Other cities under the yoke of tyranny were likewise liberated, and some dispeopled towns, like Acragas and Gela, were colonized. After twenty years of troubles, Sicily was to have a respite now. Carthage made peace, the Hellissus being again fixed as the frontier, and she undertook to do nothing to uphold tyrants in Greek cities. Timolean had now delivered Sicily from both domestic despots and from foreign foes, and having achieved his task, he laid down the powers which had been granted to him for its performance. Among the great men in Greek history, he holds a unique place. For the work which he accomplished was inspired neither by selfish ambition nor patriotism. He sought no power for himself. He labored in a strange land, for cities which might adopt him but were not his own. Patriotism, indeed, in the widest sense, might stimulate his adore when he fought for Hellas against the Phoenicians. But of Greek leaders who achieved as much as he, there is none whose conduct was, like Timolaeans, wholly guided by simple devotion to duty. The Syracusans gave him a property near Syracuse, and there he dwelt till his death, two years after his crowning victory. Occasionally he visited the city when the folk wished to ask for his counsel, but he had become blind, and these visits were rare. He was lamented by all Greek Sicily, and at Syracuse his memory was preserved by a group of public buildings called after him. The land had rest for twenty years after Timolaean's death. 
the direct results of his work did not amount to more than that. A tyrant arose then of a worse type than the elder Dionysus, and his hand was heavy upon Sicily. But the career of Agathocles lies outside the limits of this history. Thus ends chapter 11. Recording by Paul Sutton. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Burry, Chapter 15, Part 12. Events in Great Greece On the mainland, as in the island, the Hellenic name seemed like to have been blotted out, there by the Phoenicians and the Italian mercenaries, here by the native races. The power of the elder Dionysus had kept at bay the Lucanians, the Mesopians, the Iapogeans, and other neighbors who pressed on Great Greece. But when his son was attacked by Dion, the Syracusan Empire dissolved of itself, and the barbarians of Italy, having no great power to fear, began anew to descend from the mountains on the Greek settlements of the coast. A number of tribes in the toe of the peninsula banded themselves together in a league with their federal capital at Consentia. And this Brescian League, as it was called, aimed at subduing all the Greek cities of the promontory, Tyrena, Hipponian, Nusibaris, and Traeus, and other places were captured. Men were not blind to the danger which menaced western Hellas, of being sunk under a tide of barbarism. One of the objects of Plato and Dion had been to drive all the barbarian mercenaries out of Greek Sicily. But in Italy the peril was greatest, and there was sore need of help from without. The appeal of Syracuse to her mother Corinth, and the coming of Timolean, put it into the mind of Terrace, hard bestead by the neighboring peoples, to ask succor of her mother Sparta. The appeal came at a favorable moment. Sparta was not in a position to undertake any political scheme at home, and King Archidamus eagerly embraced the chance of going forth to fight for Hellas against the barbarians of the West, even as his father, Agrisilus, sixty years ago, had fought against the barbarians of the East. He got together a band of mercenaries, chiefly from Phocian survivors of the Sacred War, and sailed to Italy. For four or five years seemingly he strove against the barbarians, but without winning any decisive success, and was finally killed at Mandonia in a battle with the Lucanians. The ineffectual expedition of Archidamus was a striking contrast to the brilliant achievements of Timolean. But Terrace was not ungrateful for his efforts. She had commemorated her appeal to Sparta by many beautiful gold pieces on which the infant Taurus was shown supplicating Poseidon of Cape Teneris. The tragic issue of that appeal suggested a motive for another series of coins, and called forth one of those pathetic illusions which Greek art could achieve with matchless grace. Taurus is represented riding on his dolphin and sadly contemplating a helmet. It is the helmet of the Spartan king who had fallen in his service. Taurus was soon forced to seek a new champion. She invited Alexander of Molotia, the uncle of Alexander the Great, and this king saw and seized the chance of founding an empire in the west, of doing there on a small scale what his nephew was accomplishing on a mighty scale in Asia. He was an able man, and success attended his arms. On the east coast of Italy, he subdued Mesopians, and pushed as far north as Sympontum, which he captured. In the west, he smote the Brescian League, seizing Consentia and liberating Turina. His power was so great in the south that Rome had made a treaty with him and it is possible that his designs reached to Sicily. The welcome given to this ally and deliverer was also reflected in the money of Taurus. Coins were struck with the seated eagle of Dodona, and the thunderbolt of Zeus beside it. But Taurus presently felt her own freedom menaced by the conqueror, and she renounced her alliance. War ensued, Therai upholding Alexander. The barbarians profited by these struggles to rise against their conqueror, and a battle was fought at Pandosia. During the engagement, a Lucanian exile in the Tarentine army stabbed the king in the back, and the design of an Epirot empire bestriding the Hadriatic perished with him. This befell not long after the overthrow of the Persian monarchy on the field of Guagamela. But Alexander's work had not been futile. Henceforth, Taurus was able to keep the upper hand over her Italian neighbors. End of chapter 15, part 12. Recording by Paul Sutton. Chapter 16, Part 1 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 2, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 16, Part 1 The Rise of Macedonia. After the Battle of Mantinea, when Thebes retired from her aggressive policy, Athens stood first, the most important state in old Greece. She would have been free to devote all her energies to re-establishing her power on the coasts of the northern Aegean and by the gates of the Pontic waters, and would doubtless have successfully achieved this main object of her policy, if two outlying powers had not suddenly stepped upon the scene to thwart her and cut short her empire. These powers, Caria and Macedon, lay in opposite quarters of the Greek world. Both were monarchies, both were semi-Hellenic. Macedon was a land power, Caria was both a land power and a sea power, but it was as a sea power that she was formidable to Athens. Of the two, it was Caria which seemed to Greece the country of the future, and to Athens the dangerous rival. Of Macedonia little account was taken by the civilized world, and Athens expected that she could always manage it. No prophet in his happiest hour of clairvoyance would have predicted that within thirty years Caria would have sunk back into insignificance, leaving nothing to posterity save the sepulchre of her prince, while Macedon would bear the arts and wisdom of Hellas to the ends of the earth. Section 1 Athens regains the Chersonese and Euboea. The death of Epaminondas delivered Athens from her most dangerous and active enemy, but the intrigues which he had spun against her in the north bore results after his death. Alexander of Ferrae, who had become the ally of the Thebans, seized the island of Peparetus with his pirate ships, and defeated an Athenian armament under Leosthenes. He then repeated the daring enterprise of the Spartan Telotius, sailing rapidly into the Piraeus, plundering the shops, and disappearing as rapidly with ample spoil. The Athenians replied by making a close defensive and offensive alliance with the federal state of the Thessalians. The stone of the treaty is preserved. The allies of both parties are included. The Thessalians bind themselves not to conclude the war against Alexander without the Athenians, and the Athenians in likewise without the president, Aachen, and league of the Thessalians. And the treasurers of Athens are directed to pull down the stele on which the former alliance with Alexander had been inscribed. But the Athenians vented their indignation within their own walls. Since the capture of Oropus, there had been signs of smouldering discontent at the conduct of affairs. Callistratus had been indicted and acquitted in the matter of Oropus, but his credit had been roughly shaken, and Alexander's insult to the city at her very doors excited the popular wrath to such a pitch that the statesman, as well as the defeated admiral, was condemned to death, and escaped only by a timely flight. Thus the ablest Athenian statesman of the fourth century passed from the stage, and no sympathy followed him. Some years later he ventured to return from his Macedonian exile, hoping that the wrath of his countrymen would have passed away. The wrath had passed, but it had not been replaced by regret. On reaching Athens he sought the refuge of suppliants at the altar of the twelve gods, but no voice was raised to save him and the executioner carried out the doom of the people. The Athenians were always austere masters of their statesmen, and it sometimes appears to us, though in truth we seldom have sufficient knowledge of the circumstances, to justify a confident judgment, that they unreasonably expected, and in gathering where no seed had been sown. The public indignation, which had been aroused by the daring stroke of the tyrant of Ferrae, was enhanced, by the bad tidings which came from Thrace. King Cotes, the reviver of the Odrysian power, had succeeded in laying hold of Cestos and almost the whole peninsula 
which guards the entrance to the Propontis, in spite of the Athenian fleet. Soon afterwards the old king was murdered, and his realm was divided among his three sons. This change was advantageous to Athens, as she could play off one Thracian prince against another. The territory on the Propontis fell to Cersobleptes, who was supported by the Oiboian Caridemus, a mercenary captain, who had frequently been employed in the service of Athens, and had married, like Iphicrates, a daughter of the Thracian king. Cersobleptes engaged to hand over to Athens the entire Chersonese, except Cardia, the enemy of Athens, which was to remain independent. But there was no fleet on the spot to enforce the immediate fulfillment of the promise, and, when an admiral was presently sent out, he was defeated by Caridemus. At length a capable man was sent, Caras, a daring, dissolute, and experienced son of Ares, who speedily captured Cestus, and punished the inhabitants for their unfaithfulness by an unmerciful slaughter. Cersobleptes was forced to change his attitude, and the peninsula was recovered. The Athenians, adopting the same policy which they had followed in Samos, sent out settlers to the Chersonese. In the same year Euboea was won back to the Athenian League, and there even seemed a fair prospect of accomplishing what of all things would have rejoiced the most, the recovery of long-lost Amphipolis. But their new scheme against Amphipolis may be said to open, in a certain way, a new chapter in a history of Greece. Section 2. Philip the Second of Macedonia The man for whom Macedonia had waited long came at last. We have met once and again in the course of our history kings of that ambiguous country, Hellenic and yet not Hellenic, Alexander playing a double part at Plataea, Perdiccas playing, with consummate skill, a double part in the war of Sparta and Athens. But now the hour of Macedonia had come, and we must look more closely at the cradle of the power, which was destined to change the face, not only of the Greek, but of the Oriental world. In their fortress of Aegea, the Macedonian kings had ruled for ages, with absolute sway over the lands and the northern and northwestern coasts of the Termaic Gulf, which formed Macedonia in the strictest sense. The Macedonian people and their kings were of Greek stock, as their traditions and the scanty remains of their language combined to testify. They were a military people, and they extended their power westward and northward over the peoples of the hills, so that Macedonia, in a wider sense, reached to the borders of the Illyrians in the west and of the Paeonians in the north. These hill tribes, the Orestians, Lunkestians, and others, belonged to the Illyrian race, and they were ever seeking to cast off the bond of subjection which attached them to the kings of Aegea. In Illyria and Paeonia they had allies, who were generally ready to support them in rebellion, and the dangers which Macedonia had constantly to encounter, and always to dread, from half-subjugated vassals and warlike enemies, had effectually hindered her hitherto from playing any conspicuous part in the Greek world. Thus the Macedonian kingdom consisted of two heterogeneous parts, and the Macedonian kings had two different characters. Over the Greek Macedonians of the coast, the king ruled immediately. They were his own people, his own companions. Over the Illyric folks of the hills, he was only overlord. They were each subject to its own chieftain, and the chieftains were his unruly vassals. It is clear that Macedonia could never become a great power until these vassal peoples had been completely tamed and brought under the direct rule of the kings, and until the Illyrian and Paeonian neighbors had been taught a severe lesson. These were the tasks which awaited the man who should make Macedonia. The kings had made some efforts to introduce Greek civilization into their land. Archelaus, who succeeded Perdiccas, had been a builder and a roadmaker, and following the example of Greek tyrants, he had succeeded in making his court at Pella a centre for famous artists and poets. Euripides, 
the tragic poet, Timotheus, the most eminent leader of a new school of music, Zoexis the painter, and many another may have found pleasure and relief in a change from the highly civilized cities of the South to a new and fresher atmosphere where there were no politicians. It is sometimes said that Macedonia was still in the Homeric stage of development. There is truth in this, but the position of the monarch was different from that of the Homeric king. No law bound the Macedonian monarch. His will was binding on his subjects, and against him they had only one solitary right. In the case of a capital charge, the king could not put a Macedonian to death without the authority of a general assembly. This was the charter of Macedonian liberty. Fighting and hunting were the chief occupations of this vigorous people. A Macedonian, who had not killed his man, wore a cord round his waist and until he had slain a wild boar, he could not sit at table with the men. Like the Thracians, they drank deep. Bacchic mysteries had been introduced. It was in Macedonian air, on the banks of Lake Ludius, that Euripides drew inspiration for his Bacchae. We have seen how Perdiccas slew his guardian and stepfather Ptolemy, and reigned alone. Six years later, the Illyrians swooped down upon Macedonia, and the king was slain in battle. It was a critical moment for the kingdom. The land was surrounded by enemies, for the Paeonians at the same time menaced it in the north, and from the east a Thracian army was advancing to set a pretender on the throne. The rightful heir, Amyntas, the son of the slain king, was a child. But there was one man in the land, was equal to the situation, the child's uncle, Philip, and he took the government and the guardianship of the boy into his own hands. We have already met Philip as one of the hostages, who were carried off to the Thebes. He had lived there for a few years, and drunk in the military and political wisdom of Epaminondas and Pelopidas. We know not why he was allowed to return to his home, soon after the death of Ptolemy. Perhaps it was thought that his affections had been firmly won by Thebes, and that he would be more useful to her in Macedonia. Philip was twenty-four years old when he was called upon to rescue his country and the dynasty of his own house. The danger consisted in the number of his enemies, foreign invaders and domestic pretenders, and pretenders supported by foreign powers. Philip's first step was to buy off the Paeonians by a large sum of money, his next to get rid of the pretenders. One of these, Argaeus, was assisted by Athens with a strong fleet. Philip defeated him, and did all in his power to come to terms with Athens. He released without ransom the Athenians, whom he had made prisoners in the battle, and he renounced all claim to the possession of Amphipolis, which his brother, King Perdiccas, had occupied with a garrison. Gold easily induced the Thracians to desert the pretender whom they had come forth to support. But the Paeonians were quieted only for the moment, and the Illyrians were still in the land, besetting Macedonian towns. It was necessary to deal with these enemies once for all, and to assert decisively the military power of Macedon. Philip had new ideas on the art of war, and he spent the winter in remodeling and training his army. When the spring tide came round, he had ten thousand foot soldiers and six hundred horsemen, thoroughly disciplined and of great physical strength. With this force he marched against the Paeonians and quelled them in a single battle. He then turned against the Illyrians who refused to evacuate the towns they held in the Lincestian territory. A great battle was fought, in which Philip tested his new military ideas. The Illyrians left seven thousand on the field, and the vassals of the highlands, who had supported the invaders, were reduced to abject submission. When he had thus established his power over his dependencies, and cleared the land of foes, Philip lost little time in pushing eastward, on the side of Thrace. The motive for this rapid advance 
was the imperative necessity of obtaining gold. Without gold, Philip could not develop his country, or carry out his military schemes. The Macedonians were not a commercial folk, and therefore his prospects depended on possessing land, which produced the precious ore. In Mount Pangaeus, on his eastern frontier, there were rich sources of gold, and incited by him, a number of people from the opposite island of Tassos, where the art of mining was well understood, had crossed over to Crenides on that mountain, and formed a settlement. But in order to control the new mines, it was indispensable to become master of the great fortress on the streamon, the much coveted Amphipolis. The interests of Philip thus came into direct collision with the interests of Athens. Here Philip revealed his skill in diplomacy. When he released the Athenian prisoners, he professed to resign all claim to Amphipolis, and on this basis negotiated a peace with Athens. When the treaty was concluded, a secret article was agreed upon, by which Philip undertook to conquer Amphipolis for Athens, and Athens undertook to surrender to him the free town of Pydna. It is probable that this secret engagement was not made until Philip had actually attacked Amphipolis, and the Amphipolitans, preferring Athens to Macedon, had sent a request for Athenian succor. The moment was inconvenient, as the forces of Athens could not be spared from the Chersonese, and the Athenians, failing to grasp the situation, trusted the promises of Philip. Of course, Philip deceived them, and they deserved no sympathy, for their own part of the agreement was a shameful act of treachery to Pydna, their ally. Their orators might cry out against the perfidy of the Macedonian, but the truth is that they sought to make Philip a tool of their own designs, and he showed them that in diplomacy he was not their dupe but their master. When Philip had taken Amphipolis, he converted the Thasian settlement of Cranides into a great fortress, which he called after his own name, Philippi. He had thus two strong stations to secure Mount Pangaeus, and the yield of the gold mines, which were soon actively worked, amounted to at least one thousand talents a year. No Greek state was so rich. The old capital, Aegaea or Edessa, was now definitely abandoned, and the seat of government was established at Pella, the favorite residence of Archelaus. This coming down from Aegaea to Pella is significant of the opening of a new epoch in Macedonian history. Not long afterwards Philip captured Pydna. If the seizure of Amphipolis was an injury to Athens, the capture of Pydna was an insult. He then took Potidaea, but instead of keeping it for himself, handed it over to the Olynthians, to whom he also ceded Anthemus. The Olynthians, alarmed by his operations on the streamon, had made proposals to Athens for common action against Macedon. The Athenians, trusting Philip, had rejected the overtures. But when they found that they had been duped, they would have been ready and glad to cooperate with Olynthus, and it was to prevent such a combination that Philip dexterously propitiated the Olynthians, intending to devour them on some future day. With the exception of Methony, the Athenians had no foothold now on the coast of the Thermaic Gulf. They formed alliances with the Thracians of the West, who were indignant at the Macedonian occupation of Crenides, and with the Paeonian and Illyrian kings, who were smarting under their recent discomfitures. But Philip prevented the common action of the allies. He forced the Paeonians to become his vassals, his ablest general, his only general, he used to say himself, Parmenion, inflicted another overwhelming defeat of the Illyrians, and the Thracians, again bought off, renounced their rights to Mount Pangaeus. But the success cost Philip little. Having established his mining town, he assumed the royal title, setting his nephew aside, and devoted himself during the next few years to the consolidation of his kingdom, and the creation of a national army. 
It was in these years that he made Macedonia. His task, as has been already indicated, was to unite the hill tribes, along with his own Macedonians of the coast, into one nation. The means by which he accomplished this was military organization. He made the Highlanders into professional soldiers, and kept them always under arms, caught by the infection of the military spirit, seduced by the motives of emulation and ambition. They were to forget that they were Orestians or Lincestians, and blend into a single homogeneous Macedonian people. To complete this consummation would be a work of years, but Philip conceived the project clearly and set about it at once. A professional army with a national spirit, that was the new idea. Both infantry and cavalry were indeed organized in territorial regiments. Perhaps Philip could not have ventured at first on any other system. But common pride and common desire of promotion, common hope of victory, tended to obliterate these distinctions, and they were done away with under Philip's son. The heavy cavalry were called companions of the king and royal soldiers and they were more honorable than the infantry. Among the infantry there was one body of royal guards, the silver-shielded Hippaspistae. The famous Macedonian phalanx, which Philip drilled, was merely a modified form of the usual battle line of Greek spearmen. The men in the phalanx stood freer, in a more open array, and used a longer spear, so that the whole line, though still cumbrous enough, was more easily wielded, and the effect was produced not merely by the sheer pressure of a heavy mass of men, but by the skilful manipulation of weapons. Nor was the phalanx intended to decide a battle like the deep columns of Epaminondas. Its function was to keep the front of the foe in play, while the cavalry, in wedge-like squadrons, rode into the flanks. It was by these tactics that Philip had won his victory over the Illyrians. But Greece paid little heed to the things which Philip was doing. The Athenians might indeed encourage his Illyrian and Paeonian enemies, and urge the Thracians to drive him from Mount Pangaeus. But though he had outwitted them, they could not yet see that he was an enemy of a different stamp from a Cotis or a Cersobleptes. Having managed Macedonia for a hundred years, they had little fear that as soon as they had the time to spare, they would easily manage it again. When Philip married Olympus, the daughter of an epirate prince, the event could cause no sensation. The birth of a son a year later stirred no man's heart in Greece, for who, in his wildest dreams, could have foreseen in the Macedonian infant the greatest conqueror who had yet been born into the world. If it had been revealed to man in that autumn that a power had started up which was to guide history into new paths, they would have turned their eyes not to Pella, but to Halicarnassus. End of chapter 16, part 1